there's no mistaking the sound of pollution. But even as the black exhaust cloud dissipates, it doesn't really disappear, leaving an indelible mark in the memory of Mark Bedard. I'm running in the morning and sometimes I, I have one of those, you know, old uh, diesel school buses in front of me and I, I can hardly breathe. Ironic, given that when Bedard founded Lion Bus in 2008, the diesel engine was the beast that made his buses go. His company grew and became profitable, but those fumes lingered. Bedard would become inspired by the potential for electric buses and trucks. He even gave a speech on it six years ago. And for, you know, 20, 25 minutes, I was telling the people, yeah, it's possible, but everybody was questioning if it's possible. Even if they didn't believe, it only mattered that he did. Those diesel machines were contemporary dinosaurs, and it was only a matter of time before they became fossils. Today, his school buses have a range of 400 kilometers and can recharge in as little as a few hours. What we were saying at Lion is that if we don't do it now, at some point it's gonna to be too late. And then the people were saying, well, yeah, but is it too early? Say, well, maybe 10 years ago, it was too early. His timing appears to have been spot on. His company, now renamed Lion Electric, is shaking up the industry, signing big deals with the likes of Amazon and Ikea. Lion's high voltage roar makes for a busy shop floor. In fact, Bedard's challenge quickly went from having people accept the concept of electric buses and trucks to having enough space to meet demand. The numbers speak for themselves. A planned US expansion will increase output from 3,000 to 23,000 vehicles per year. Even beyond Lion's shop walls in the quaint town of Saint Jerome just outside Montreal, things are changing too. Lion offers anyone access to a charging station in its parking lot, and they're all occupied. The EV1 is GM's first totally electric, non-combustible fuel on board passenger vehicle. A decade or two ago, consumers looked at electric vehicles or EVs as a curiosity. Today, they're turning heads as much for appeal as necessity because Canadians need a spark. In fact, our love of SUVs and pickups helped raise overall emissions from transportation about 30% over the last 20 years. More EVs on the road will mean reductions in CO2, not only from transportation, but also on the main source of emissions, oil and gas production. Comparing the impact of EVs versus combustion engines is the main focus of these University of Toronto researchers. Professor Heather McLean has crunched the numbers. We showed essentially that we'd have to have about 90% of electric vehicles in the fleet by 2050 to, to meet uh, the, the targets of the Paris Agreement. Postdoctoral researcher Alexandre Milovanov knows the question really is, when will Canadians turn their backs on the roar of the internal combustion engine for the hum of electric? So I think they're getting ready. Uh, they could push harder, but I think there is also the chicken egg problem, right? If yeah. you don't have the EVs on the road, does it make really sense to invest that much infrastructures? But if you don't have the infrastructures, does it make sense to buy an EV? And around and around we go. To even buy an EV in Canada is made more difficult by the fact in 2021, 70% of dealerships don't have models on the floor. Again, it's the chicken and the egg. So how do we catch up? Well, price is an ongoing issue. Even with government rebates, EVs are still more expensive than their gas counterparts. And then there's what's known as range anxiety. High-end models top out around 600 kilometers, more than most people would need on any given day. But the fear of running out of juice remains. Although battery technology is improving at a rapid pace. Uh, by 2030, uh, most of the reports are estimating that they're gonna be probably twice more energy dense. What does that mean? It means for the same mass, you'll have twice more energy getting out of it. And will our energy grid be able to handle it? Eventually, yes, says Joanna Kiriazis of Clean Energy Canada, which looks at how to make the shift to clean tech and renewable energy. I think, you know, if all of a sudden we were going to increase the number of EVs on the road by 200% uh, tomorrow, then, then no, we're not going to be ready. But if we put the, the policies and plans in place um, to make the shift happen in a predictable way, then, um, then yeah, electric utilities can make those infrastructure upgrades where needed. Another big challenge, how we redesign our cities for the EV revolution.
consider some of Montreal's more densely packed neighborhoods, like the Plateau, where residents are always moving their cars around to accommodate street parking laws, or Toronto's West End, with its narrow streets and high density. 80% of all EV owners plug their cars in at night. But what if you don't have a driveway? Those people and homes are referred to as garage orphans, and you're absolutely right, we need a solution for them. Charge stations exist, even though they aren't everywhere, but it's not nearly as fast as gassing up your car. Beyond the unlikely scenario of tearing everything down to build back up, ideas like mass charging stations at postal outlets or mandating charging stations at workplaces are being bandied about. There's also a move to um, community charging hubs. So, you know, maybe it's a, a community center or an elementary school in your neighborhood that um, can have a, a bunch of charging stations installed and then people can park there overnight, plug in and leave in the morning. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Windsor MP Brian Massey has been flying the EV flag for over a decade. He's seen his share of the ups and downs in the auto sector and worries Canada is in danger of missing out on the benefits of an entirely new manufacturing economy. I don't like the strategies of waiting around and figuring it out later on um, or leaving it to others. Where he sees opportunity is in something Canada has in abundance, the rare metals that go into EV batteries, notably lithium. And it might surprise you, but a new Democrat and an environmentalist believe Canada needs to get more into the mining game. Uh, we, we have to be cognizant though that there is some other costs for this, that there is a upfront cost to the innovation, and there's also some environmental costs that are a little bit different. Uh, but if we build them into the plan and we bake them into the system, we can actually use it to our advantage. If not, we're going to give it up to somebody else. Uh, and that's not right. That doesn't make any sense. We've been pushing for the same thing. The metals and mineral resources that we have, um, they, they do help Canada bring some bargaining chips to the table. For Massey, who, like his father, once worked in Windsor's auto factories, it goes beyond retooling the grid and auto sector. It's about ensuring Canada has a seat at the EV table. I think that we have to say we want to be a nation of builders, uh, whether it be in automotive, whether it be in manufacturing in the wood, uh, in the agricultural sector in many respects with some of the innovation taking place there. It's what Lion Electric's Mark Bedard said when he began transforming his company. Now he can say with pride that he's doing what was previously inconceivable for a Canadian automotive startup, signing big deals with the biggest companies and expanding his operations into the U.S. When we see that the world is changing, the, the full ecosystem is, is, is changing and right now. And, uh, and, and this is, I think this is, this is awesome. This is great.